In this talk, we'll discuss atherosclerosis and the prognostic value of vascular calcification when encountered on medical imaging in different parts of the body. Conceptually, I think of atherosclerosis as an arterial wall disease characterized by two major issues, chronic inflammation of and fat deposition within the arterial wall. It's not entirely clear which of these two is the cause and which is the effect, but in all likelihood, it's probably a chicken and the egg sort of situation. Most folks believe that repetitive cycles of arterial wall inflammation, damage, and repair contribute to the deposition of calcium within arterial walls, and that this entire process is modulated by factors such as high blood pressure, diabetes, obesity, smoking, and a patient's genetics. Let's review the natural history of an atherosclerotic plaque. Here is a cross-sectional drawing of an artery with blood flowing through its lumen. The arterial wall consists of three layers. The inner intima that's in contact with the blood pool, a thick media that's predominantly smooth muscle, and an outer layer of adventitia. The natural history of an atherosclerotic plaque may begin as early as when a patient's still a child in elementary school and lipid begins to accumulate inside the cells of the intimal layer of the arterial wall. The amount of intracellular lipid accumulation and resulting thickening of the intima continued to progress during the patient's high school years and college years, and perhaps by the time they're in their 20s, in graduate school or out of college, not only has intracellular lipid accumulation continued to increase within the intimal layer of the arterial wall, but pools of extracellular lipid have also begun developing there too. Things may continue to progress as our patient moves through their 30s and their 40s. During the years of life, they may be building a family and their career. And by the time they've arrived in their 50s, the amount of intracellular lipid and the size of the extracellular lipid pools within the intimal layer of the arterial wall have become large enough to substantially narrow the lumen through which the blood flows, though perhaps not narrow enough to be symptomatic. Throughout this entire time, numerous cycles of arterial wall inflammation, damage, and repair have also been occurring, which may have resulted in the appearance of many microcalcifications within the intimal wall too. Although the situation may be clinically silent, there's always a chance things could change really suddenly too, since the cap of intimal cells covering an extracellular pool of lipid can sometimes be very thin. If the cap were to suddenly lose its integrity, the extracellular lipid pool would be directly exposed to the blood flowing through the arterial lumen and since an exposed lipid pool can be highly thrombogenic, a rapid cascade of thrombosis could be triggered that could completely and rather suddenly occlude the lumen of the artery, resulting in potentially lethal consequences. That's why we refer to atherosclerotic plaque at this stage as vulnerable plaque. Vulnerable plaque is a pretty unsettling situation since the amount of stenosis is usually still asymptomatic and the plaque clinically silent right up until the instant the cap were to suddenly rupture. And medical imaging won't be helpful most of the time either. On a typical x-ray or non-contrast CT image, vessel wall, plaque, and flowing blood will all be close enough in attenuation to be visually indistinguishable. And those microcalcifications too tiny to see, resulting in a vessel that's visually identical to a healthy vessel with no atherosclerosis. Now, if we were to do a conventional or a CT angiogram, you might be able to see something out of the ordinary. But how would you have known to do an angiogram of this particular patient with a vulnerable atherosclerotic plaque if they were symptomatically no different than all of your other patients with no atherosclerosis at all. So 
let's put a pin in that question for now and continue our overview of the natural history of an atherosclerotic plaque whose cap didn't rupture. In this scenario, the accumulation of intracellular lipid and extracellular lipid pool growth would eventually reach a point where the amount of luminal narrowing would be great enough to be symptomatic in at least some patients. It's at this stage that a phenomenon called positive remodeling may sometimes occur. In situations where positive remodeling occurs, the diameter of the entire artery increases to permit the diseased vessel an ability to handle a more typical amount of blood flow despite the presence of substantial plaque burden. In addition to positive remodeling, in more advanced atherosclerotic plaques, much larger macrocalcifications begin to develop, and if they develop superficially over an extracellular lipid pool, they can effectively wall off the lipid pool and actually lower the risk of a catastrophic cap rupture and acute thrombosis, resulting in a stable atherosclerotic plaque with macrocalcifications that are now large enough to be visually discernible on X-ray or non-contrast CT images. As we follow the natural history of an atherosclerotic plaque further, we'll reach a point where intracellular lipid accumulation and extracellular lipid pool grow to an amount beyond what positive remodeling can compensate for, resulting in substantial luminal stenosis and symptoms in not just some, but most patients. So let's summarize our top-level concerns regarding atherosclerotic plaques. There are vulnerable plaques and there are stable plaques. Vulnerable plaques usually represent atherosclerotic plaques at an earlier point in development than stable plaques and may be clinically silent. While the vascular occlusion from a stable plaque tends to occur progressively, vascular occlusion from a vulnerable plaque can occur quite suddenly and without warning. From an imaging perspective, the calcifications in stable plaques are often visible on non-contrast CT and X-ray, while the calcification in vulnerable plaques may sometimes be invisible. This is possibly why most MIs actually occur in coronary arteries with low-grade stenosis. This means predicting MIs is not just a matter of looking for folks with significant coronary artery stenosis. So what are the clinical implications when we encounter vascular calcifications, or more specifically, vascular macrocalcifications, when we're imaging a patient with no symptoms of atherosclerotic disease? Let's look at it this way. Patients without atherosclerosis don't worry us too much, and patients who are already symptomatic will usually get captured for workup and treatment by their PCPs. That leaves these two particular stages of atherosclerotic disease and vessels with vulnerable plaque that may not only be clinically but also radiographically silent as the most diagnostically challenging. However, there's an indirect way vessels with vulnerable plaque might be indirectly flagged on x-rays and non-contrast CT. If we were to see a vessel with stable plaque and macrocalcifications, it would stand to reason that perhaps a different vessel might be present elsewhere that's still at an earlier stage of atherosclerosis and have plaque that's vulnerable and at risk for sudden catastrophic acute occlusion. So the TLDR regarding vascular calcifications that are visible on x-ray or non-contrast CT imaging is that they can be an indirect sign of silent vulnerable plaque elsewhere, in addition to, of course, serving as a marker for the extent of atherosclerotic plaque burden in a patient and a patient's overall likelihood of experiencing a future major adverse cardiovascular event. Now, there is one wrinkle we need to mention. Atherosclerosis is not the only disease that can result in macrocalcifications within arterial wall. While atherosclerosis generally results in intimal arterial wall calcification, there are a number of other diseases that result in medial arterial wall calcification. While these sorts of disease 
might not be as susceptible for acute thrombosis or stenosis, they can result in much stiffer arterial walls that may lead to altered hemodynamics and heart failure. The top four examples of these sorts of di um, diseases are diabetes, renal failure, systemic inflammation, and radiation. From an imaging perspective, these diseases can sometimes be distinguished from atherosclerosis since they tend to result in a vascular calcification distribution that's more diffuse and concentric than in atherosclerosis and involve smaller arteries as well. The imaging studies on which we're most likely to encounter incidental vascular calcifications are coronary, chest, and abdominal pelvic CTs, in addition to chest x-rays, pelvis x-rays, lateral lumbar spine films, x-rays of the distal extremities, and mammograms. Coronary artery calcification on CT may be scored qualitatively on common chest CTs as mild, moderate, and severe. With appropriately protocoled coronary calcium CTs, Scoring can be done objectively, relying on computer-aided analysis of three millimeter thick CT images for the amount of coronary artery calcifications greater than one square millimeter in size and 130 Hounsfeld units attenuation, weighted by calcification density, resulting in a value known as the Gadsden score. The literature suggests that coronary artery calcification is predictive for cardiovascular events, cardiovascular mortality, and all-cause mortality. Aortic arch calcification on chest x-rays may be scored by summing how many sixteenths of aortic arch circumference appear calcified on a frontal chest x-ray. On lateral chest x-rays, the amount of aortic arch calcification may be scored as none, moderate, or severe. The literature suggests that aortic arch calcification on chest x-rays is predictive for cardiovascular events, but may be of poorer predictive value for cardiovascular mortality and all-cause mortality. Thoracic aortic calcification on CT may be scored on a yes-no basis. The literature suggests that thoracic aortic calcification is of relatively poor predictive value for cardiovascular events, cardiovascular mortality, and all-cause mortality. Abdominal aortic calcification on lateral lumbar spine x-rays may be scored by summing the length of anterior and posterior aortic wall calcification in front of the L1 through L4 vertebra. The literature suggests that abdominal aortic calcification on x-rays is predictive for cardiovascular events, cardiovascular mortality, and all-cause mortality. Abdominal aortic calcification on CT may be scored by summing the proportion of calcified abdominal aortic circumference on each 1 mm CT slice of the inferior 10 to 15 centimeters of the abdominal aorta above the aortic bifurcation. The literature suggests that abdominal aortic calcification on CT is also predictive for cardiovascular events, cardiovascular mortality, and all-cause mortality. Iliac and femoral artery calcification on pelvic x-rays may be categorized as either intimal or medial in type and scored by dividing the pelvis into quadrants and summing the number of quadrants in which linear calcifications appear. The literature suggests that medial pattern iliofemoral arterial calcification on x-rays are predictive for cardiovascular events, cardiovascular mortality, and all-cause mortality. This is the calcification pattern that's more diffuse and concentric. On the other hand, the literature suggests that intimal pattern iliofemoral arterial calcification, a calcification that's more patchy in its distribution, is predictive for all-cause mortality, but may be of poorer predictive value for cardiovascular events and all-cause mortality. 
forearm and digital arterial calcification on x-ray may be scored by dividing each hand into distal and proximal halves, palms versus fingers, and summing the number of halves in which linear calcifications appear. Forearm and digital arterial calcification are usually medial in type. The literature suggests that forearm and digital arterial calcification are not predictive for cardiovascular events, cardiovascular mortality, or all-cause mortality. No scoring method exists for lower leg and pedal arterial calcification on x-ray. As in the forearm and hand, lower leg and pedal arterial calcification tend to be medial in type. The literature suggests that lower leg and pedal arterial calcification are not predictive for cardiovascular events, cardiovascular mortality, or all-cause mortality. No scoring method exists for intramammary calcification on mammography. However, the literature suggests that intramammary calcification is predictive for cardiovascular events and cardiovascular mortality, though maybe non-predictive for all-cause mortality. If we tabulate the predictive value of arterial calcification on X-ray and CT imaging, we arrive at a table that looks like this, with coronary arterial, abdominal aortic, ileal femoral arterial, and intramammary arterial calcification being the most strongly predictive of cardiovascular outcomes. This doesn't mean that we should de-emphasize calcification at other vascular sites, however. Despite um, describing the presence and location of thoracic aortic calcification can allow surgeons to avoid certain types of operative complications, and identifying the presence of distal extremity calcifications may potentially flag for disorders like diabetes. <laughs>